bear with me with this. I'm going to talk for the next 20 minutes. Some of it hopefully will make sense. Some probably won't. Um, it was one of those ones when I was initially asked to speak, which I, I'm really pleased that it's a great honour. That and you put on the spot for a title, and I came up with the title and then forgot about it for a few months, and then thought, what was I thinking of? So I've gone back to definitions, and I suppose for, for the health side, we're taking the, the classic public health definition uh, of a very holistic, wide definition. And for city, a, a, a more nuanced version of the city, um, which was uh, coined by my colleague, uh, Conan Levy. Um, I, I'll attribute things to Conan Levy when they're my own, and I'll test them and see how they go down. If they go down well, they'll be mine next time. I'm going to focus on Liverpool, um, with a, a bit of a focus on, on the 1850s and 1980s, key points in public health, key points for Liverpool. Um, history is important, in particular when it comes to, to public health, uh, and this, this same from Karl Marx always springs to mind. Um, why Liverpool? Because it's typical. It's typical of a city, of an urban area that has gone through change. Um, th this is a, an outline of deprivation with highlights of Liverpool, the capital of the United Kingdom. Um, and when we zoom in on there, uh, we see the red. The red isn't good. We have some of the, the highest levels of deprivation in the country. This was Liverpool in the, the 1980s. A typical photograph, this is the waterfront, derelict. This is what it looks like now. This is a shot by um, Bernard Rose, uh, taken now at the bottom uh, with a few new buildings, uh, and as it was in 1989. But you've got to be careful with these things. Colouring things makes a huge difference. If it had been cloudy on that day, people would have just said, it's just the same, but a few high-rise flats. What is the real difference? Uh, and that is a concern for me. We talk about regeneration uh, and um, reigniting the, the, the health and well-being of the city. I don't know how well you can see these uh, graphs. But basically, what we've done is we've decanted poor health from the city centre. That is now in two rings around the city around the outskirts of the city, and then again, further afield, right on the edge of the Liverpool city region. And the second graph there, uh, it's map there, the darker red shows the decline in, 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 well, the increase in deprivation in those areas. So what we're experiencing, uh, uh, the poor getting poorer. And alongside that, we have the ill getting iller. Back to the title, Public Health Heroes, Villains and Others. Public Health Heroes, it should be easy, in particular in Liverpool, we, we've got a, a strong tradition in these heroes. I asked um, a couple of uh, the PhD students to uh, come up with a, their public health heroes. Sorry, Pat, you're on page three, mate. <laughs> um, and it just showed the, the, the breadth. Um, some of these uh, are, are, are alive and well, um, some not so. And they span hundreds of years, and a number of those are within Liverpool. We have, well, we don't have an expression, that was a lie. We should have an expre expression. Where's, where there's a list, there's a, and for those people outside of the UK, there's two things. Where there's a list, there's a crap program on Channel 4 at Christmas where they come up with arbitrary lists, and it goes on for about three hours, and you get caught watching it. The other thing is top trumps. We have top trumps for most things. I've had a few attempts, a few failed attempts at top trumps. The first one was anabolic steroids, which I thought was going to be a real um, game changer and make my fortune. And it was things like you compare spatial configurations and anabolic components. And the only one other person that played this game with me not only left their job, they left the country. So I realised it was a bit too niche. So I went to communicable diseases, everywhere, everyone's interested in them, and we thought things like bubonic plague, a, a real like, game changer, a, a, an attention grabber, and Spanish flu. And 
you can start to tease out the differences. So then I had the brainwave, public health heroes. And we can focus on Liverpool. We, we've got, we've got the, this old stalwart of um, William Henry Duncan, uh, whose catchphrase, not by the hairs on my chinny chin chin, caught on for a number of years. We have Edwin Chadwick, um, who was voted the best beard, although in later life you'll see it's quite frizzy. And these were people who made a huge difference uh, to public health. Mary Seacole, my personal favourite, who the disadvantages that oh, she overcame to make a difference to people's lives were immense. We have the three Liverpool classic um, uh, uh, stalwart of uh, uh, public health. We have Duncan, um, who is uh, the first um, public health officer. We have Newlands, who was the borough engineer. He created the sewage systems. And Thomas Fresh, who was the envi first environmental health officer. And there isn't a picture of him. And he, it by far, is the most interesting character. He served time in prison as a youth, was married three times, was a bankrupt, has got pubs named after him, and probably did more to protecting the lives of uh, the, the people of Merseyside in the 1850s, 60s, and 70s than anyone else. He was a real character. There's Newlands, best beard going. John Snow, as you all know, he had massive impact on um, qualitative research, quantitative research, starred in Game of Thrones. He, he did an awful lot of good stuff. And we've got some people living, John Ashton. I've done 70 plus for his contribution because he's still alive and kicking. And again, Margaret Whitehead in Liverpool, who made real changes uh, uh, for, uh, on a global scale around inequalities. And they, they, how do we compare these people? We can't. And then there's other factors that we have to look at in public health. There's people like him. Um, this is Tufty the Squirrel. And you have to be from the UK and of a certain age to remember this character. But he took over the television screens. He had his own club. He had his own club established 20 years before he was... Uh, this, I don't need to spend so much on him. We'll go straight to him. But the point I'm trying to make about Tufty is he got into everyone's living room he had a major impact and didn't do a thing for public health because he wasn't real. People did not. This was, apart from the fact he was a squirrel, obviously, he was always with his mother. All he was interested in was eating ice creams. He wouldn't hang around with the cool kids. And in our school, if you were caught doing something really swatty, people called you tufty. So his message over crossing the road it didn't happen at all for most people. In the UK, we focused a lot on public information films in the 70s and 80s, things like Health at Work, we had Crossing the Road, we had this one, Petunia, if someone's drowning, do something about it, those kind of things. My personal favourite is the one, the bottom in the middle, which is the most reassuring one of all, that in the event of a nuclear war, go under the stairs and everything will be fine. And these all focused on behaviour change. And we talk a lot about behaviour change now, but that's what, we, that's what these were about. We don't know if they had any impact. Here's one that anyone of my age will remember. I am the spirit of dark and lonely water ready to trap the unwary, the show-off, the fool. And this is the kind of place you'd expect to find me. But no one expects to find me here. It seems too ordinary. But that pool is deep. The boy is showing off. The bank is slippery. I'll leave it there. Absolutely terrifying. Did it have an impact on behaviour? Yes, it did. Me and my sisters used to go to Sefton Park, and we used to recreate it. I was the youngest. They used to make me lean over the water while one of them with the hood went, I'll be back, like that, which isn't great for public health or public safety. So, yeah, it, it had an impact, but it has to have an impact in the right direction. I want you to listen to this fella, and what he says makes sense. What you have to do is bear in mind when he was saying it, which was in the mid-80s. 
Well, obviously, there's a number of key agencies and groups that have to be consulted uh, on an issue like setting up a syringe scheme. Now, the, the first group uh, it's obviously imperative to discuss a proposed scheme with are uh, drug users themselves. The advantage of our centre here is that we're based next door to the drug dependency clinic and many of the customers going in the clinic uh, actually come in here from time to time, so we knew them anyway. So, so we asked them how, what they thought about the idea of setting up a syringe scheme and obviously th they thought it was a good idea, but they give us very good advice and tips uh, on what we should build into a scheme or make sure it didn't get into a scheme. For example, if the media got hold straight away that we were thinking of running this scheme, um, the media tended to be sensationalist. Uh, and we were very aware that they could cause problems if they dealt with the issue wrongly. So we actually did a deal with the local press. We said, we're going to set this scheme up, but we'd rather you didn't actually do anything on it until it had been running for a few weeks and you'd have something to report about. And the deal was, if they left it for a few weeks, they would, if you like, get the exclusive. We'd tell them first and they could take the credit for announcing it. Uh, the other agency that um, hold the key to any scheme starting at the local police. Um, that was always a fear the customers had, what well, the police going to nick us if we bring our equipment in. Uh, the police on Merseyside are, are quite unique. As far as they're concerned, AIDS is as big an issue, if not bigger, uh, to deal with than drugs themselves. So they were quite happy to back off the scheme, not cause us any problems, and even to the extent where they're prepared to advertise it. So the police have been very supportive. Um, so we'll move on from that. I mean, the things to come out from that uh, about engagement with users, user involvement from the beginning, how to establish things. It, it's like how to for, for community led activism. And it happened decades ago, but we still keep making the same mistakes when we develop services. Um, I'll, I'll give an example of missed opportunities. I'm going to go on to villains. That, that was Alan Parry, and he, he's, a, he's a personal hero. Um, villains and others, and, and I thought a lot about this or, or over the grammar, and it's not villains and others, it's villains and others, and you'll see what I mean. It's about victim blaming, and, and that's a key issue that we have. We've always had it. Th th this is Liverpool, and it, it's to my shame, when we talk about Liverpool, we are built on the, the, the blood of slaves and the sweat and bones of the Irish. Um, this is a ship, this is called a Guineaman, and it was used to transport slaves. And that shows how you can squeeze in 650. In actual fact, they used to squeeze in 800. The other one is a depiction uh, of the Irish famine. And um, Liverpool, it, 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 it has this stain, it also feeds into the characteristics of the city. We like to think we've moved on so much, but if we look at the next image, we see how we're still experiencing the echoes of others, of victim blaming, of avoiding our social responsibilities because they're not like us. And that's something that we, as people involved in city health, in public health in general, we need to bear this in mind at all times. We need to fight the rhetoric of, well, they brought it on themselves, or, oh, it's not our problem. This is um, a picture from uh, the mirror, and absolutely disgusting. Shock as man appears to inject himself in town centre. The disgusting was about the person, not about the fact that we're a high-income country, and yet this still happens when we have solutions to these things. One of the key things that we need to focus on are the most vulnerable and the disadvantaged, the homeless. We need to move away from the pictures of people begging on our streets and the demeaning situation of that to looking at what they can do and what we can do with them and in partnership and the things that they can bring to our lives. The quote before, history repeats itself, first is tragedy, second is farce. I disagree with. Every time it repeats itself, it's a tragedy, and we keep going down this route. We need to, to, to learn our lessons. We need public innovation. We need public health innovation. We need people to, to, to become more aware. And we need people, not just the innovators. The innovators we always have, and we cherish them. 
It's the early adopters, the practitioners, the people who implement things. But equally, those people in, in office, those people within city councils, those people in positions of authority who make the choice not to block things. In many cases, it's as important about what you don't do as about what you do. And we saw that in the implementation of harm reduction in Merseyside, where the police didn't block it, the church didn't block it, the city council didn't block it, the health authority didn't block it. Many of those people supported it, but at the very least, they didn't stop it happening. And we need to motivate and we need to engage people at all levels of society for the benefit of public health. Thank you for your time.